Designing a simple payload. We are going to go through the steps to design a simple atmospheric recording device. The following parts are chosen for their cheapness and availability, but if you're designing a payload to fly, you'll want to choose sensors that are appropriate for whatever experiment you're designing for. Here we'll be just demonstrating how to look at the problem and how to design a controller system with lots of sensors. When launching a high altitude weather balloon, the sensor payload will reach the higher layers of the Earth's atmosphere, and when it reaches a peak, the balloon will pop, and it will fall with a parachute slowing the fall at the lower layers of the atmosphere. Because the source of lift is a weather balloon, we have to minimize our mass of our payload. The real flight profile isn't like this shape, and the atmosphere density doesn't necessarily drop off at this rate, but we'll examine those at a later section. We just want to design a simple thing that records the air pressure, temperature, and humidity onto an SD card. This is the basic function of a sensor payload. You have a power source being regulated and feeding into a central controller. The controller steps through all of the sensors that you have and then records onto some storage device. And because sometimes the flight and the fall can be rather violent, you have a housing that's designed to protect all of this. So let's start by choosing our battery. If we think back to earlier, there might be two particular batteries that were suitable for our purposes. So which one is better? If we take capacity in milliamp hours and divide by mass in grams, we'll get milliamp hours per gram. This chart shows the capacity per mass of all of the batteries that we looked at earlier. We have the industrial battery, which was 400 milliamp hours, but it was 8.9 milliamp hours per gram. Then we have lithium, which had the highest capacity, and it also has the highest capacity per mass, which means that for every milliamp hour, there's less grams in this battery. So how do we take this 9-volt source and then regulate that voltage for a 5-volt device like an Arduino? Well, looking at the board, here is its power regulator. Its part number is NCP1117. If we look at the datasheet, we can find the electrical characteristics. The chip's typical output voltage is 5 volts, and it normally has a dropout voltage of about 1. What that means is it's able to regulate power as long as the input is at least 1 volt over the output. So for this chip, that means that it's able to supply 5 volts as long as its input doesn't go below 6 volts. The bottom of this chart shows the maximum current that this chip can supply is around 1500 milliamps. If we take another look at our two candidate batteries, we can see where the cutoff voltage for their power would be here on these charts. They'll both cut off once their voltage reaches below 6 volts. We can get power to the Arduino from these batteries using a simple 9 volt to barrel jack connector. Now we've defined how we're going to power our system, and since we're using the regulator chip on the Arduino, that obviously means that our controller is the Arduino as well. So how are we going to store and recover the data that we record? A micro SD card is a good candidate for storing large amounts of sensor data. Here's a level shifting micro SD card breakout from SparkFun. Level shifting just means that this board can work with 5 volt levels as well as 3 volt levels. And it allows you to directly interface with a micro SD card using SPI, where SPI is a type of digital interface. We're going to test this out by recording some qualitative optical data from a photocell. Here's the circuit that we're going to work up to. Here's our photocell connecting directly to 5 volts, the 5 volt and ground lines, and the output of the photocell and the large connector is all of the interface pins for the SD card. Here's a program with an empty setup and loop function, but we have a little data already entered in. We have two include lines that gives this program access to the SPI and SD libraries. SPI is how the Arduino is able to talk directly to the SD card, and the SD library is how you can actually manipulate files. File log file is a variable for accessing the files in the SD card. File name is the actual file name of the file we want to create. The log select pin is a pin that's used to make the SD card respond to commands. And card detect is how we can tell there's a card inserted into the breakout board. Already began is a variable that's used to check to see if this card has already been initialized. Down here we have an initialize card function. I got this from the SparkFun GitHub for this breakout board. This function is used to create the file that we want to log data to. And here we have our main empty functions. We're going to begin our serial port so we can get data from the Arduino. And we're going to set card detect to an input.
then initialize the card, and then log file equals sd.open file name. File write will open up logfile.csv for writing. If we do an if check with log file as the argument, this will check to see if the file was opened properly, and if this is true, then we'll print file contents to the file. Then we close out this file. If log file wasn't opened properly, then we'll print that to the serial port. So this program will just open up a file and print file contents to the file and then close it. And here's the file that was created on the SD card. Now that we have the SD card working, let's add in the photo cell. Create an integer called light pin and assign it to analog pin 0. We'll create an unsigned long variable called timestamp. This will track how many milliseconds have passed since the program started. And then another integer called light level. We'll change what's printed in the setup to light, comma, milliseconds just to label our data. In our loop, we'll write if not digital read card detect, then we want to initialize card. This will make it so that if a card is removed from the breakout board and then reinserted, it'll get reinitialized. Light level equals analog read our light pin. Timestamp equals millis, which is how many milliseconds the program has been running. And now to log this data to the SD card, we do the same thing as the setup function. Log file equals sd.open file name for file write. If log file is opened properly, Print to the log file the light level, separate that with a comma, and then print the timestamp with a new line. That's what println means. Then close the log file. Don't forget the else block just to make sure that you can tell when the file hasn't opened properly. And here's the data after recording for a while and waving my hand over the photo cell. Here we can see the low regions for when the photo cell sees darkness and the high regions for when it sees brightness. Now that we know how logging is going to work, let's move on to the sensors. We wanted a humidity, pressure, and temperature, so let's start off with humidity. We're going to choose a DHT11, which is a cheap and common humidity sensor. Here's a screenshot of a wiring diagram that I got from Adafruit. The red line is 5 volts, the green line is data, and the black line is ground. You can see the data pin is connected to 5 volts through a 10 kilo ohm resistor. This means that normally the data line will sit at 5 volts, and then when the sensor wants to say something, it will pull the voltage down to ground. Like the SD card breakout, the DHT11 sensor talks to the Arduino using a particular style of binary pulses. The SD card uses the SPI library to communicate, which means that this is already built into Arduino. However, a library for the DHT sensor isn't already within the Arduino libraries. We can go to Adafruit's GitHub and find their DHT sensor library, and this will allow us to communicate with the sensor. Just go to the GitHub and clone or download the repository. To make this library available to your Arduino programs, you'll have to copy the folder into your Arduino Libraries folder. Here, it's under Home, Arduino, and Libraries, but if you're on Windows and Mac, it'll be under Documents, Arduino, Libraries. Here we have an empty program. Let's go ahead and include the library for the DHT sensor. This DHT.h is inside that library folder. We'll create an instance of the DHT library called hSensor for humidity sensor, and the data pin is connected to Arduino pin 2. In our setup, we'll begin our serial port, and then we'll do hSensor.begin to start up the sensor. First, we'll delay 2 seconds since that's the refresh rate of this sensor, and then we'll serial print hSensor.readHumidity. This is going to read the humidity value from the sensor and then print it out to the serial port. And here's a screenshot of the data read from the sensor. Now that we can record humidity, let's move on to pressure. We're going to use a BMP280. Here's a close-up of the sensor breakout board. The small metal can in the top center of the board is the actual sensor module. This board is similar to the SD card breakout because it's level shifting, so it works with both 3 volts and 5 volt interface. 
You can also use the sensor using SPY, which is the same as the SD card, or you can use I2C, which is a different type of digital interface. We're going to use this sensor through I2C. This means we'll have VCC connected to 5 volts, ground connected to ground, SCK will be connected to A5, and SDI will be connected to A4. I2C communicates with controllers via two wires, SDA and SCL, for serial data and serial clock. While the Arduino already has libraries built in for I2C, there are some other details for the BMP280 that require a library. So we'll download the BMP280 library from Adafruit. If we look inside the library folder, we'll find Adafruit underscore BMP280.h. This is called a header file. If we look at the contents of the header file, we can see all of the functions that are available in the library. Our DHT sensor had a begin function that was used to initialize the sensor. This library has a similar begin function that is also used to initialize the sensor. The DHT library had a read humidity function for actually fetching the data. This library has some similar functions like read pressure and read temperature for fetching data from the BMP280. Here we already have our simple program written. We have two lines to include the wire library for I2C and the Adafruit BMP280 library. We have a variable called a BMP that is an instance of this library. We begin our serial port, and this if check block will check to see if the BMP sensor is properly connected. It runs BMP.begin and receives a callback from the sensor to let the controller know that everything is fine. If this callback isn't seen, then we know something's wrong with the sensor wiring. This while one line will just make sure that the program freezes if a problem is detected. This bmp.setSampling function sets all the configurations for the sensor. And then in our loop we want to print to the serial port bmp.readPressure, which will fetch the pressure data in pascals, and then delay half a second. And here's the data captured on a serial plotter. The pressure sensor was stimulated using a sandwich bag and then squeezing air into it. Now we want to read temperature, but our humidity and pressure sensors both have internal temperature sensors. So let's read from both of those and then create an average. Here's a program with all of the variables and libraries already set up for the humidity and pressure sensor. We have our humidity library and variable, our pressure sensor library and variable. We begin our serial port, start up our sensor with hsensor.begin, check to make sure the pressure sensor is wired properly, and then set configuration for the pressure sensor. Let's create a float called btemp since it's going to be from the barometer, equals psensor.readTemperature, and then let's duplicate this line since the humidity sensor library also has a function called read temperature. Let's create another float called average, and then just average these two values. All the data is collected, now let's print to the screen. All these values should be separated by commas so that Arduino knows how to deal with the data. And end with a slash n, which is the same as println. It creates a new line. If we run this program, we can see this data in the serial port, which is three columns of temperature in Celsius. Leftmost column is temperature from the barometer, center is humidity's temperature sensor, and rightmost column is the average. And here's the chart of the data with the top and bottom being pressure and humidity sensors, and the middle line being the average. We can see the BMP280 has a higher resolution internal temperature sensor than the humidity sensor because of the smaller vertical steps on its chart. Now that we know all of the components for our mock payload, we're ready to put all of this together in one machine. In our next installment, we're going to do just that, and we're going to look at how well the system will perform in a real-life flight. Thanks for watching.